Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Denaus' stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Denaus is one of the world's largest owners of container ships. The company makes money by renting out its vessels on long-term contracts to various companies. Its current fleet is 71 ships with an aggregate TEU of 437,000. TEU stands for 20 foot equivalent unit. This means in total its ships can carry 437,000 20 foot containers. The company is headquartered in Piraeus, Greece and was founded in 1998. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 1.8 billion market cap. They're trading at $88 a share and they have 21 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. The company has positive free cash flow each year. It was lowest in 2021 at 72 million. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's huge in 2021, over 1 billion. Revenue is a sales for the company. And that also peaks in 2021 at close to 700 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you a gross profit. And that grows about 80% from 2020 to 2021. Below that is their operating expenses. Below that is their operating income, which is highest in 2021 at 358 million. They receive 12 million of interest on their investments, which is their highest ever. And they pay 69 million of interest on their debt, which is higher than 2020, lower than 2018 and 2019. They paid 1.3 million in financing costs, which is lower than 2020, 2019 and 2018. Then you have other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses, not part of the company's core operations. If they sell a vessel, the profit or loss on that sale goes into other income and expenses. Then you have your pre-tax income, then your taxes. It doesn't look like they pay much in taxes. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was huge in 2021. That's mainly from the 758 million in other income and expenses. I would just focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. That's a better indicator of how the company's doing. This is the company's income statement from their annual report. And this gives us a little more info than Yahoo Finance. The top line is the revenue, the sales. That was close to 700 million in 2021. Their revenue in Europe was 338 million, Australia and Asia 323 million, and America 28 million and it grew a lot in every region from 2020 to 2021. They spent 24 million of voyage expenses, 136 million of operating expenses. These are all the various expenses to maintain the ship. 117 million of depreciation and amortization, another 10 million of amortization, 44 million of GNA. This includes the payroll for support functions like the executive team. So their operating income was highest in 2021 at 358 million. The reason their net income was so high in 2021 was this $578 million gain on an investment. This company owns stock in Zim. And Zim's stock price has gone up so much, this company has a huge unrealized gain. So they didn't sell the stock, but they have to mark to market their investment. It says right here, unrealized gain related to Zim. If they do sell the Zim stock, they will realize that gain. Earnings per share in 2019 was 829, then 651. Look at their EPS in 2021, 52. It almost seems impossible to grow from 651 a share to 52. If this was a new company, maybe it can have that growth. But for a company that's been around a while, it's pretty impressive. They did increase their shares outstanding from 2019 to 2020. It was almost 24 million in 2020. 
but they did buy back some stock. Now it's down to 20.3 million. This is their statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. And that was highest in 2021 at close to 430 million. They spent a lot on CapEx in 2021, buying new vessels. They spent more on CapEx in 2018, 2019, and 2020 combined. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And it is positive every year. It is small in 2021 because they invested so much into their business. For the past four years, they paid down more debt than they issued. They've been doing a good job deleveraging their business. And they bought back 31 million of stock in 2020. We saw their shares outstanding decreased on their income statement. This is the operating section on their statement of cash flows. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income of 1 billion. Then you add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. We have to subtract out that unrealized gain on Zim. But the income statement reported a gain of 577 million. Why are we only subtracting 544 million? Because Zim paid a dividend. So we have to net out the dividend payment because the dividend payment is a cash item. So they generated 428 million of cash flow in 2021, even though their net income was over 1 billion. That's why I like to look at operating cash flow. I think that's a much better indicator of how the company's doing than net income. Usually operating cash flow is higher than net income as it was in 2019 and 2020. If it's lower, that could be a problem. You wanna find out why, and we know why. I like to track a company's revenue, that's a blue line, and operating cash flow, that's the orange line. And both those numbers are at their peak at the end of 2021. Every year, it seems like they have positive operating cash flow and pretty consistent revenue. I know the shipping industry can be really cyclical, but their numbers look pretty good. Here's the investing and financing sections from their statement of cash flows. In their investing section, they spent 356 million in vessel acquisitions. They received 196 million from an investment. It looks like the $196 million investment they received was from the sale of stock. They sold some of their Zim and HMM stock. HMM is a South Korean shipping company. In their financing section, they added 1.1 billion of debt. They paid down 1.3 billion of debt. They received 135 million from the sale and leaseback of some vessels. So in their financing section, they had a cash outflow of 221 million. This is the equity section on their 1231 balance sheet. They have 2.1 billion of equity. They raised 771 million from selling their stock and they profited 1.4 billion from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. 2.1 billion of equity, 1.3 billion of debt. They're 61% equity, 39% debt. Their net debt is 784 million. Net debt is debt minus cash. This blue line is their equity balance since 2015. The red line is their debt balance, and their debt was higher than their equity for several years. But recently, their equity is now higher than their debt. Their cash balance is at its highest point since 2015. So things seem to be improving for this company. And the company's doing a really good job at deleveraging. Their leverage was 7.3, now it's 2.5. When a company is deleveraging, that means their percentage of debt is getting lower. I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 13.5% to be conservative. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 2.5 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today's and weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $2.2 billion. We divide that by 21 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 108. They're trading at 88, so they're trading at an 18% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The forecast is for their revenue to hit 924 million by 2023 and 860 million by 2022. That's how I got their revenue for 2022 and 2023. And then I grew their revenue at a similar rate up through 2025. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. As of now, they have 873 million in contracted revenue for this year. So they should easily hit this 860 million. And so far they have 750 million of contracted revenue. And of course they're gonna get more. So I think there's a good chance they could hit that 924. 
on average, they convert 25% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 25%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. The website simply Wall Street is on another planet. Their valuation is 349. They're saying the stock is 74% undervalued. Two analysts priced this stock, one at 110, another at 125. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. And it's pretty obvious looking at this chart how high shipping rates have gotten in 2021. Their stock price was below $5 at one point in 2020, and then it broke through 100. This is a really cyclical industry, so you never know when it's going to go up really fast or down really fast. They were getting close to getting delisted, so they did a 1 for 14 reverse stock split in 2019. Reverse stock splits are a common thing in the shipping industry. In the past five years, this stock has gone up 250% while the S&P is up 90%. But you just don't know when the decline will be. Say for instance, you had the stock back here in 2018, and then you were down 50, 60, 70%, and you were really upset. And then the stock started going up. You might have sold when you broke even. Say you held out a little more and doubled your money then tripled your money, then quadrupled your money. It's easy to look at now, but in a year from now or two years from now, it might be right back down below $10. It's really dependent on the shipping rates. The company's cargo capacity has been growing each year from 360,000 to 400,000 to 437,000. They added six vessels in 2021, and 95% of their revenue is contracted out in 2021. So this gives them stable revenue streams for this year, and 77% is contracted out in 2023. Container shipping has been growing each year. You can see from 2000 up through projected 2023, it's expected to continue growing. Shipping by vessel is the best way to transport large heavy items across the sea. The success of this industry lives and dies by shipping rates. You can see how high rates have gotten in 2021. If the supply chain issues continue, we may see shipping rates rise even more. They pay a quarterly dividend. They brought back their dividend in 2021 and they raised their dividend in 2022 by 50%. It's up to 75 cents. The dividend yield is close to three and a half percent. The yield is projected to stay steady at a little above 3% for the next few years. And you could see back in 2019, the company did a one for 14 reverse stock split. As we mentioned earlier, when we look at the stock price chart, their beta is 1.4, so the stock moves a little more than the market. It's gone up 67% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 9%. The 52 week low is 47, the high is 107, and the stock is trading between its 50 day and 200 day moving average. About half a million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 21 million shares outstanding, 9.5 million are on float, 25% are held by institutions, and 1.5% of the shares are shorted. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have been up 50% after a couple of years. Then you would have been down about 80 or 90%. But if you're still holding on, you'd be at 17,500 today. That's about a 6% annual return. So you could see how volatile this industry is. 41% of the company is held by individual insiders, 24% by institutions, 22% by the general public, and 13% by private companies. The CEO of the company owns 39% of their stock. The next biggest is Sphinx Investment, then Impala, RBF Capital, and No Street. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a PE below two. The reason their PE looks so good is because their net income is so high due to that large mark to market gain we looked at earlier. Their price of sales is 2.6, that stock price of a sales per share, and their price to book is below one. A lot of companies in this industry have a really good price to book because those vessels are assets which inflate their balance sheet. And their price to free cash flow is 25. That stock price of a free cash flow per share. Let's look at their non-current assets. They have 2.9 billion of fixed assets. These are the value of their vessels. 79 million of right of use assets. These are assets they lease from another company. 11.8 million of deferred charges and 42 million of other. Let's look at their non-current liabilities. 1 billion of debt. They owe 137 million on a lease back transaction. 
they owe 24 million of interest, 38 million of earn earned revenue. This is when a customer prepays for a product or service before it's delivered. And once the company provides the product or service to the customer, then they remove this amount off their balance sheet and book it as revenue onto their income statement. Their return on invested capital is 10%. They can cover the interest payments with their operating income more than five times. They have a really good ROE of 50%. That's net income over equity. They can cover the current liabilities with their current assets two times and their quick ratio is 1.9. Let's look at their current assets. 129 million of cash, 7.1 million of accounts receivables. This is how much money their customers owe them. 12.6 million of inventory. They have 2 million of prepaid expenses. This is when a company makes an advance payment for a product or service that they're going to receive in the future. 22 million of money due to them and they have 459 million of other. Most of that 459 million is stock they own in Zim. Let's look at their current liabilities. 19 million of accounts payable. This is how much money they owe their vendors. 21 million of accrued liabilities. These are expenses the company has incurred but hasn't paid it yet. 96 million on long-term debt. 86 million on leaseback debt. 83 million of earned earn revenue and 8.6 million of other. They generated 72 million of free cash flow in 2021. They have over 300 million of working capital and they paid out 62 million of dividend payments. So it seems like the company is well funded and I expect their free cash flow to be a lot higher in 2022 because they're probably going to spend less on vessel acquisition. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are 34 companies in the same industry as Denaus. And if Denaus has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. Their dividend is higher than the average company. They rank 7th in market cap, 1.8 billion. The average is about 1 billion. Their price to book and PE are better than average. Although their price to free cash flow is a lot worse than average, that's because there was so much in CapEx in 2021, so they had low free cash flow. And their three-year annual growth rate is higher than average, a much better ROA and ROE. So to summarize, I have them trading at an 18% discount, but you don't really know the future of this company because it's really dependent on shipping rates. I do think shipping rates should be strong this year. And once again, some cities in China are getting shut down due to COVID. That's going to put more pressure on other countries to fulfill the demand. I know lots of my subs have made good money on the shipping industry the past few months. I hope it continues. I rank their free cash flows 5 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 10 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below.